meta. Now, why we have chosen llama? No particular reason. We could have discussed palm also. Palm comes from whom? Google. So, almost all big companies having a stake. It is not just open AI, it is not just uh, Facebook or whatever, meta or it is not just uh, Google. Almost everybody is having their own LLM because nobody can get away, I mean stay away from that. So, now let us talk about Lama. So, Lama came around uh, 2021-2022, more like 2022. There are two variations of Lama. One is called Lama and Lama 2. So, I will talk about both the variations briefly, but more important, why did we choose this architecture to discuss today is very simple because I told you last session, we do not want you to become uh, users of chat GPT who enjoy, oh, I made chat GPT do this, I made chat GPT, that is not your profession. Then. What are you supposed to do? Design a new LLM or modify a new LLM. If you design a new LLM also, you are an idiot. What you should do is take an LLM and re-engineer that LLM to see what purpose it serves. So, the reason we chose Lama is basically to show you how re-engineering of an existing platform which was the old uh, GPT model, how it has resulted over a year time or several years time. So, it is illustrative because uh, you know the original attention model came in 2017-2018 and this came around 2022. So, you can see in 4 years what was the fundamental change which happened to that architecture and why the change happened. It is not just change for change sake, but change with a purpose, change with a meaning. So, why did that change get incorporated and what were the motivations behind those change. Having said that, what we are doing with Lama is uh, we are doing couple of things. A, we have started download, uh, we have started installing or we have installed Lama on our GPU uh, here. But the problem is Lama comes with a relatively naked user interface. I mean the API is not as well refined as uh, chat GPT is. Chat GPT has a uh, nice API, probably longer in the game that is why it has a, a better API. Uh, so, what we are doing, in fact, uh, some of your seniors, I mean seniors in the sense, two years your seniors, uh, they are working with us to see whether we can uh, streamline and create an API, a web service around it, which makes Lama look like chat GPT. I mean, we retain the same uh, UI, uh, not UI, UI we are not bothered, but the same API interface and make Lama look like chat GPT. Now, why is that being done? So that when you do your projects, you do not use chat GPT, you use Lama and our own Lama and which is installed. So, hopefully by the time you come to that stage in the project, you, you do not have to use uh, open AI, you can use Lama if you give you that interface and all that. Now, Lama uh, 2 also is almost on par with GPT, GPT 4, almost on par. But there are, so that is one reason why we are taking Lama. The second reason is uh, Lama is completely open source, uh, which means now you will say, uh, well, how does it matter? Well, it matters that I could not download uh, open AI, I could not download chat GPT, which is not available. It is available only in the packaged version where I have to pay for the API and I use the API, it is hosted. So, I cannot host it, which means if I have to use it, I have to pay you or I have to pay uh, Microsoft or OpenAI. So, here Lama that way has been open sourced. Now, the reason chat GPT can never be open sourced is even if they want it. The problem is chat GPT has been trained on proprietary corpus. Some of the corpus which has been uh, dealt with uh, uh, or used by uh, chat GPT, that corpus is not in open domain. That means it is not accessible. So, as per law, Anything which has been trained on a restricted corpus uh, obviously gets into a copyright issues. Though you do not see what corpus they have been trained on which is a private corpus, you are not allowed to share that product into open domain. So, chat GPT will never become an open domain. Uh, whereas, Lama what they have done is they have trained it on a open corpus on only on the world wide web. So, only the information which is commonly available 
the training which has been done for it is from that domain. As a result, obvious benefit is that uh, it can be hosted, it can be used, it can be, uh, you know, there are no copyright issues, all of that. So, uh, that is the other motivation for using or talking about Llama. A, we can create an API and use it, second and host it, uh, the second uh, or equally important thing is, uh, we looked at various models, it looks apparent that uh, the, the model of Llama, I, I do not think we are going to have the highest scale model, not the 70B, but one version less than that. Uh, so that model we are going to host, uh, because our A100 can take only that model. I do not have a, I do not have a farm of A100, so we will have a single A100 with 4 GPUs, so uh, hosted and that will have that. Now this is possible because the inference model of Llama is far smaller, they say, than the chat GPT inference model. So it is easy to host. Of course, you cannot train it, you can only fine tune it. If you start training it, again it will need multiple A100s and all that. So we are not training it, we are going to use it for inference and fine tuning, that is what most of your projects will, because training is not our cup of tea in terms of compute power. Uh, so so that is the quick background. Now we will start looking at the underlying architecture of Llama and how it varies compared to uh, let us say the rest, rest of the architecture. So I will start change by change, I do not have that picture, but I think most of you know that picture. I think this is going somewhere else. I will draw the picture here and probably we can take it from there. So let me draw the basic transformer. We know that there are two parts to the transformer. There is a feed forward network and there is a attention network. And at the top of the feed forward network, there is the feedback which comes from the input and comes here. And here we add the input back and we also normalize it. Then you have here the input embedding, we talked about the word vector and here we add the positional embedding. So, we will start working from that upwards just to understand how this architecture varies. This is the classic architecture, this has been there now even today when we say attention network everybody thinks of this attention network and remember the only thing which changes is the kind of attention mechanism we said in GPT-3, GPT-4 we have. 96 attention heads and we have 96 layers, now that keeps changing and increasing or decreasing as various versions come. But essentially this is the core architecture. Now let us start working with it uh, one by one and try and understand what and why the changes have been done. Okay? First I will start from the bottom up because it is easier to appreciate it from the bottom up. Now here in the original architecture, we had something called positional em embedding. What was positional embedding? It was basically because we are dealing with the sentence as a whole, first we created embeddings of every word. I am just tracing back so that you are in sync. So every word in the sentence was converted into some kind of a vector. We talked about how smart that vector is, I gave you examples of how that vector arithmetic works on that vector, but essentially we get a vector. So the input gets converted into a sequence of vectors. I also talked about the dimension of each vector. We said that the dimension of each vector in case of GPT-3 or GPT-4 is 12,288. That is the dimension of each of those input vectors, each of those words, correct? Then we said depending upon the position in the word, sorry, position of the word 
in the sentence some more embedding is added see the word they use is concatenation but we know we do not use the word concatenation we use the word addition. So, that gets added to that. Now, in the original model there were two things one is the positional embedding was basically uh, absolute embedding absolute position which means that if you have a large sentence especially large sentence let us say of 50 words it is not difficult to imagine that you would have 50 positions and those positions would get added to each vector. Now, what was observed is that by doing it this way the sensitivity to the relative positions is going away. Sometimes two words are close to each other they mean something, but the same two words in a different sentence if it is long then the distance between them increases unnaturally. Okay. Uh, what I am trying to get at is what we are interested let us make it very simple what we are interested is not the absolute position, but the relative position of the words do you understand the difference between relative position and absolute position. See the relative position is how far this word is away from this word that is of interest because that is how attention mechanism gets influence attention gets influence not by the overall position, but by the relative position because attention is how much of that comes to me it is dependent on of course, what that word is and also how far it is relative to me why should I be bothered whether it, I am the 10th word and he is the 20th word it should not come different if I am the fifth word and he is the 15th word I hope you are getting again I will repeat. Suppose in a given sentence I am the fifth word and he is the 15th word and in another sentence I am the 10th word and he is the 20th word should there be any difference from just the distance point of view no he is 10 words away in that sentence he is 10 words away in this sentence. So, his influence on me besides of course, the word vectors and all that should be defined by my relative distance between that word and what was happening in the original architecture is that is not what was happening. What was happening is the absolute position was getting added. So, by moving from an absolute position to relative position they started improving the performance. So, there is a seminal paper which defined it. Now, what I want to do? I will go to one of the papers. So, come down. This was the another see what is happening. Nobody creates that is the point I want you to understand. Nobody creates things on their own. What people do? What do what is computer science all about? Picking some watching what is happening and once you watch what is happening you start absorbing uh, you know what is happening in that space into your algorithm that is what scientists at Meta did scientists anywhere in the world do scientists like you are also expected to do the same thing learn from things which are used in a different kind of a situation similar kind of problem, but uh, you, know, you know which you can adapt in your language model or in your architecture. So, somebody had done work you can find out uh, uh, who, who these people are that is not important at this stage. Now, the, the, so, basically this work happened around August 2022, but this is the second print the original paper happened around uh, 21. So, they took lot of ideas from here about rotational encoding. So, they said no this is not how we should think we should think slightly differently and try to understand how the basic equations came. Now, I want you to go a little de depth in maths. Now, some of you who are little thick in the mind uh, will lose me here, but I think some of you will understand what I am trying to say. So, you need to keep your intellect sharpened and think with me. So, what they said is what was our net attention? Our net intention, sorry, is that when we do the attention computation, let us go back 
I don't know how many of you remember the attention computation. What was the equation driving the attempt at attention computation? There was a query vector, remember query vector was created and a key vector was created from the input and we did Q K T, Q into K transpose and that is what caused information into value of course, that is the key value that caused the information to flow from one vector to another vector. So, the underlying equation was Q K transpose into V that was the underlying equation correct. So, that defined the movement of information across vectors and that is how we said our vectors started becoming richer layer by layer. By layer. This is what is the spirit of attention the Q K T is the spirit of attention. So, they said there is a lot of thing there Q is a function of x, x means the vector itself uh, which is absorbing the attention and m ok, m is the position of this vector this is how it was happening earlier. Now, try to understand Q my query vector in the original architecture is a function of me my vector original vector and m which is the position. So, we were only using the absolute position m and n represent the absolute positions of the two tokens we are considering the two vectors we are considering. So, the original equation was something like this f of q x m m k of n was similarly derived from the target vector whose attention we are computing and into n n was what n was the position of the second token did all of you get that m is the position to whom information is getting transferred n is the position <laughs> from where information is getting transferred ok. And v of course, depends on x n and n. So, do not do not get lost there ignore v because that is the value which is coming which is created positionally. So, let us come down. Uh, so, that is absolute position embedding uh, you see the equation was taking some weighting of x i plus p i this was the original absolute positioning equation the original paper x i plus p i p i is position which is m or n whatever depending upon the kind of vector it was adding it concatenating means adding it. So, and then remember we saw the logic for computing how to add you know if it is an odd word we use something if it is an even we do something odd bit even bit those, those are the sinusoidal uh, way of computing or amalgamating position into the word that was what the original paper was doing. Now, these people said uh, these people said now I am not going to bore you with too much there are some derivations if you have the time and inclination you can this is what they said what should be our target this is f q this is f k same f q and f k. But when we do the attention mechanism the one in the angular rep bracket represents the attention mechanism. So, when we do the attention mechanism what we should get is derived from x m x n getting it it should be derived from x m x n that is not so interesting that is obvious attention <laughs> mechanism obviously depends on that vector this vector from where to information is coming x m x n is not a surprise what is a surprise the m minus n. So, or n minus m whatever you take. So, the relative position should determine the attention mechanism. So, the q k t should somehow absorb this such that the final translation is affected not by their absolute positions, but by their relative position this is our target this is where we want to go we do not want m and n like early earlier to influence those vectors. We want m minus n to define how much attention should flow from there to here not their absolute positions anybody reached anybody got it yeah try try struggle with it you will get it I am saving you a lot of paper reading also yeah next going down little bit. So, the way they said we could achieve this 
m minus n is you know you know about polar coordinates so far we are looking at attention vectors only <laughs> in cartesian way so it so turns out they said what we will do is we will move from the so called rectangular space to the cartesian space uh, sorry to the polar space we will introduce the concept that every vector also has an angle the theta so now you understand how they did very simple there are two vectors in the n dimensional space so they said while we'll capture both the vectors and take the attention we'll capture the theta theta is what angle between these two vectors of course please understand theta is not two dimensional theta is how many dimension the angle is a rotatory angle the angle also has 12288 dimensions i hope you are while at a abstraction level you can think of an angle as the angle between two vectors actually it's an angle between two vectors both the vectors are in a 12288 dimension space in that space if you take and compute the angle between these two the polar angle they said if you absorb that angle in your attention calculation then your attention calculation will be far better so this was one of the first improvements so rather than taking m and n they said we have to take m minus n the way to take m minus n is represent the anyway these two vectors are in multi dimensional space take the angle between the two vectors and you are there so obviously the angle is also multi dimensional right in each dimension there is an angle so the angle dimension is also a vector consisting of theta 1 theta 2 up to 12288 theta right because actually much more than that because every angle is vectored with every angle okay uh, so basically this was the equation and if you spend enough time uh, you can actually get a lot of feel about this how how it's actually because see this was later converted into python so when you look at the python code for llama uh, my journey started from looking at the python code for llama and moving back then i started looking from from where did this code come and then i analyzed that code and then i realized oh this code is driven by this paper and and that is how this paper came so so the the code started <laughs> referring to that paper and so what what llama has done taken this paper converted into python implemented that rotational encoding and this is what they incorporated this is the first fundamental change that they did everybody gets this change yes. what did this help very simple no absolute so to give a very poor man's or layman's analogy whether the word is the fifth and the next word is the 15th or this word is the 10th and the next word is the 20th the attention mechanism shares equally as it should okay and of course the words themselves influence the attention but apart from that okay it's the relative distance one major change okay now we go back let's look at the next change which was done for this architecture so actually uh, there was a lot of change not lot uh, quite a bit of change done in the mha mechanism also but to explain that change to you it will take me at least 3 hours uh, the reason is <laughs> you need to understand a bit about cuda programming uh, because if you because this is all written in cuda the mha mechanism is all written in c++ coda so if i have to give you an insight into mha i have to take you into coda code elaborate on the coda code and then explain uh, in simple words what they did is in the old paper that is a 17 paper the mha was very brute force there is lot of scope for optimization as to how parallelism was there then parallelism is there now but repeated calculations are happening in the mha originally 
those repeated calculations were cut down dramatically. So the MHA mechanism of attention uh, management became much faster. Uh, maybe someday uh, later for those of you who are interested, but before that you need to build a background in Koda. If you build a background in Koda, NVIDIA will hire you. I think some of you we have somebody here working with Saran's project, Defense. No, I think we have a group which is working here. No, maybe not among you, maybe your seniors. They are working on a Sirans project for defense, which actually does a lot of uh, CUDA programming. Okay. In fact, there was a group sometime back, last year actually, uh, which was also doing a lot of work on, which did a lot of work for defense on CUDA. Defense is interested in CUDA for another reason, because they do this computational fluid dynamics and all that. So for them lot of parallelism. So if you understand CUDA then we can illustrate how, how MHA works. So I will park it for now but there is change there also but that change came not in LAMA, the change came when they moved from LAMA to LAMA 2. So then they optimized the MHA mechanism some more further. The parallel computation mechanism was optimized. Okay. So uh, going to the next change we are going to focus on that feed forward block which is on the left, the feed forward block, uh, I am going to blow it up a little and then illustrate what the change was and we will we'll try and understand why that change was needed. I think uh, it is illustrative to understand. So uh, the, the feed forward network looks like this, FFN, how does it look? This is the output, again 12,288. This is the input, input layer, actually uh, again 12,288. This is, I am talking per vector. Then there is the hidden layer. So these are so many neurons, these are so many neurons. This is 4 into 12,288. So this is about 4, 1, 4, 9, 1, 5, 2. Does that sound like a good number? Is that 4 times this? Okay. Well, it does not matter the maths. So, this is the architecture of, of the feed forward network. There is only one hidden layer in between. It is just like your regular, uh, uh, you know, kindergarten ANN. You know how kindergarten ANNs look, right? One hidden layer, input layer, output layer, one hidden layer. What people uh, on the first day learn, right, of when they attend deep learning class, what is ANN? There is a hidden layer, then input layer, <laughs> output layer. Uh, okay. So, it is very simple, actually there is only one layer, one hidden layer there okay. and uh, obviously it means that one neuron is connected to four. Okay. So, uh, but this contributes to a hell of a lot of parameters if you will. Uh, if you just compute the parameters, you will have to multiply things together because this is going there, that is going there. So, if you multiply the parameters, it becomes big number and especially if you compute this there, remember 96 layers. So, 96 times this, it that is how the size comes. When they say my llama model is so big or so small, they say it is 150 billion, it is 120 billion. Uh, how does it come? It is these numbers which matter. How, how big this matrix comes, so big the number is. Okay. Now, uh, I think most of you will know this. You know basic activation, how it works, right? So, the basic determining equation for activation is what? W1, X1 plus B or Wi, Xi, Sigma plus B, right, the bias. If you forget the bias, it is just Wi, Xi, Sigma. So, basically this is the uh, what we call the, the basic weighting and over that we use an activation function, correct. So, when, when this neuron gets activated from 
these many neurons and remember there are so many such neurons activating here, each neuron is activated through this kind of a equation, activation function into this kind of weights. So, you, you take the weights all along and compute xi, xi is each of these uh, elements and, and do this. I hope everybody knows this, this is like teaching you kindergarten of deep learning, right. So, we have an activation function, we multiply the activation function with uh, whatever is z, we normally call it z, right. That, uh, so we say activation function into z and, and you get the output. So, that is, that is what we use. Now, let us see, uh, everybody knows today what is the most common activation function? Today what is the most common activation function? Okay, 80 percent of you will say sigmoid, 20 percent of you who are smart will say ReLU, correct. It is either sigmoid or ReLU, sigmoid used to be there earlier and uh, sigmoid had all kinds of problems, you remember the saturation at both ends and people have um, uh, you know uh, tomes of books have been written <laughs> criticizing sigmoid. I think more than the sigmoid more criticism is there on sigmoid. Uh, anyway, nobody uses sigmoid any longer. Uh, what do people use? People use ReLU. But ReLU has a small problem. ReLU is better than sigmoid because it does not tend to saturate. ReLU was, sigmoid was doing what? It was saturating, correct? You have a curve like that, you will saturate. I do not know why that curve was there in the beginning, okay. Anybody could have thought, no, that you should not have a function which saturate. But ReLU also has a problem. What is the first problem with ReLU or let us say one of the problems of ReLU? Yeah, sorry? No, that is its definition. Yeah, it ignores the values on the left. You know how ReLU looks, no? ReLU, you know the graph. The problem with ReLU is, it is not a very serious problem, but it is not differentiable at 0, correct? You know differentiability, no? The function is not differentiable at 0, 0 means at the beginning. That is a problem. So, that has a trouble of when you are dealing with a huge amount of data, even at one point if it is not differentiable, you get problems. That is one issue with ReLU. There are quite a few other issues also with ReLU. And today the trend is uh, people do lo no longer use ReLU in most of the modern architectures. See, ReLU came actually from linear regression when we were dealing with smaller data and different kinds of uh, problems where we were dealing with the equations which are largely linear but had some amount of li non-linearity. So, ReLU was an apology of adding non-linearity to, to, to an equation, right. Uh, so, ReLU is there, ReLU still exists to a certain extent but most of the transformer architectures do not use ReLU. So, that is what they change. The original attention paper still use ReLU, that means the 2017 paper used ReLU as the activation function, that AF, that activation function which you was used to multiply that was ReLU, the rectified linear unit, right. Uh, so, they said no, this does not seem to be very optimal for many reasons. So, they started using a function called as the swish glue. There are two parts which happened, there are two different uh, uh, papers which happened. One is uh, there, there, there came about a function called swish. Now, swish is a is an addition to sigmoid. They said sigmoid is not having any parameters. It's it's parameter free. That means it's not trainable. That means uh, if you take a sigmoid, it remains the same irrespective of how much data and which cycle of data are you, which epoch of data are you training with. It has no variation and people do not like things which cannot change. Things which cannot change at a conceptual level are very fragile. They will break brittle, you know, uh, uh, things have to learn and adapt. So, they said <laughs> if you look at that ReLU or if you look at uh, uh, sigmoid or any other, uh, these things do not have any, any change ability, any learnable ability. As we move from one epoch to another epoch, they said why should the activation function be same? Why can't we add a learning parameter in it? Why can't we bring in another element of uh, 
variability in it so that we can tune it. What is this parameter? Parameter means you give one more knob. When you give one more knob, you are able to tune it further. You have to understand it like this. Don't hate parameters. Love them. Espouse them. Because they give you control. They give you ability to change. So they said, no, ye, ye, sigmoid, relu, ye bundle hai. Isme change nahi hota. There is no variability. We want things which can change, which can vary. So they brought in swish. I'll, I'll talk about it in a moment. Swish is what? It's sigmoid with a beta in it. They introduced a beta factor in it. We'll look at its equation and said, this beta is trainable. Now I have given you a knob on the activation function. So you can, you can tweak the activation or as, as the learning process happens, the activation function also changes. It's not brittle. It has become very flexible. So it's become very, very vibrant. Uh, so that was one motivation. The second motivation is, you know, the output of the activation function, uh, nowadays the trend is all output should be gated. So they are saying it should be a gated linear unit. Uh, gated linear unit means, you know, uh, I should control what should be the output of the activation function. I should not allow it to go to whatever and then apply normalization. They said no. Uh, nowadays this principle of maths is used everywhere. Now you will ask, why do you use gating? Why, why, why do all functions, they need a gate? Why, why are we gating everything? The reason we are gating everything is because when we are applying parameters, the parameters also have a range and gating is a nice idea where we say that I limit what I can see. It is like, to give you an analogy, it is like if I have to improve the resolution of an image, first I crop the image. I don't know whether that analogy gets in. If I have to improve resolution, I will first limit or clip the image and then improve its resolution. So they said, let us do the same thing. So our activation function should have now two qualities. They should be trainable and they should be gated. So already there was a lot of work happening on the uh, trainability, uh, uh, introducing parameter which I said, told you swish is the way. And there was also work happening on gating of these functions. So Lama guys, what they did, they said there is this algorithm or function called swiglue. What is swiglue? Combination of swish and glue. Glue is gating, gated linear unit. Swish is introducing variability, parameterization. They combined this, called it swiglue and did what? Replace the relu attention function, which was there in the earlier architecture with a swiglue architecture. Are you getting the change? So, our, our Relu went out of the picture, Swiglu entered the picture. Now, if you move to some of the other architectures, there have been changes on top of this, but we will not talk about this today, maybe some other time. It is very interesting and engrossing to see how the evolution of these attention networks is happening and happening very rapidly. Uh, this is all happening as, as we speak in matters of days and months. Uh, so, so uh, I will just show you how Swiglu looks. So this is the good old grandfather which we call the sigmoid. I am sure you have seen sigmoid n number of times. Uh, then you know the relu. Okay. These were the historical uh, functions. Next. Uh, this is the feed forward which was changed. So uh, you can read this paper at length later, but I will just touch upon what was done, what was the equation. I, I want you to understand that equation, it is just I am highlighting later we are giving you anyway all these papers. So read, but read papers. Now if you see what is swish, look at that equation for swish. It is actually a sigmoid with parameters, can you see that? It is a, it is actually sigma is sigmoid by the way. So it is x sigma of beta x. The <laughs> The greatest contribution of Swish is introducing beta, which is a trainable parameters. It changes over iterations. It changes as the attention network learns. With every epoch, the beta will also change. It is a learnable or trainable parameter. And that is how the attention function becomes more malleable and ductile. Okay? 
and that if you look at earlier functions they are all brittle they are not changing at all sigmoid chain did never change its equation relu never changed its equation this is the first time you are seeing equations which change that is the contribution of swish now swish is just a sigmoid with with parameters and also there is an x uh, next to it but if you go down yeah can we keep coming down yeah if you no keep coming down ah now this is called plain vanilla gating okay now i'll just tell you what is gating gating is basically kind of limiting it so the equation for uh, the original uh, activation is i mean good old activation is sigmoid into xw plus b correct that was the original equation for sigmoid yes no if you have a sigmoid activation that is the original equation you multiply that with xv plus c forget that c for a moment that's just the bias term there multiply with xv that v matrix is also a trainable x matrix just like w what does that v do it acts like a gate on the on the function it tries to limit the output of that function so uh, you have the sigmoid because remember you have the swish swish has an x in it so if x is fa fairly big there is a tendency for the function to get high values are you getting me see it's x sigmoid of beta x right so that x can make it grow real, really big so uh, the same problem with relu also uh, you know uh, there is also uh, a gelu what is gelu gated relu okay so swish gated swish is what we are looking for so there is a need for gating because when you have an linear function which goes on increasing you need to gate it to get more predictable output so this is the xv plus c is where the gating happens so that is how the multiplication happens so going down here they have shown uh, matrices how they multiply that's pretty trivial go down ah now watch the last equation that is the equation which is driving today's attention mechanism or lama's attention mechanism that is called swiglu can you see swiglu there so swiglu is if you take this it is swish applied on the left side part so swish on xw plus b so in place of activation function there is swish and then that is gated through xv plus c so look at that last equation so in in place of sigmoid there is swiglu uh, sorry there is swish and there is gating so that's how the word swiglu comes so one of the second or third change uh, which they did with with lama and moved it forward a uh, change to the attention network the original attention network was they changed the uh, activation function so the activation function is now swiglu and uh, today it so happens that uh, uh, even the palm 2 uh, that's another interesting architecture to study uh, in fact i could probably paint a picture like this for palm also now you'll find swiglu is being used in palm 2 also and the story is these two happened independently so the scientists at meta apparently didn't know that palm was coming or google was coming with palm 2 independently both of them thought of swiglu sometimes these things happen so uh, basically uh, now most of the which which now becomes a standard if facebook is doing it google is doing it that is standard today right so so basically swiglu uh, is is the activation function which we use so now did you absorb this change so we have talked about two or three changes there are some more i am coming there uh, we have talked about positional to rotational or relative and relative became rotational and we talked about the gating activation function undergoing a change okay so let's let's move on and talk a little bit more about what are the other other changes which happened this is another change which happened uh okay they changed normalization uh the way they did normalization remember we talked about each block we are taking one at a time and understanding the change which is being done 
again I have this fond hope that some of you will write this up and talk about the changes how they were made and create a nice article. Okay, now the change which was done was also in the normalization. So, let us go back to the original architecture for a moment, original picture. Ah, so, you see here they made two changes. Now, do not look at the left because it is a repetition. Look at the sorry, do not look at the right, look at the left. Now, can you see there after every layer there is an uh, addition and normalization. Addition is for I do not know, do you know why the addition is there? That is to remove the vanishing gradient. You keep adding the input because the differential can kill the flow back. Now, in order to appreciate why there should be addition, you need to understand uh, CNN. This theory came from CNNs, which is called ResNet, residual network. So, the addition is done to take a residue back so that you will not kill it. All your YOLO, you know YOLO, no? It is all based on darknet, restnet and all. So, they this is old theory. I mean this did not come, I mean it is as I said there in 2017, right. So, there is nothing new about taking part of the, in, uh, taking the input back and adding it to the output so that the residue carries forward, right. So, that you avoid the vanishing gradient problem. Uh, there are a couple of other problems you avoid by that. But I am focusing on the normalization, okay. First, what they did is, here there is post normalization that means after the layer has done its work after that you are normalized. So, what people discovered is uh, there is more value in not normalizing afterwards there is value if the input itself is normalized. So, what they did they shifted that normalization which you see that yellow normalization that you see they shifted that normalization part not the addition part that remained as it is. They shifted the normalization part to the input. So, they said I will I will change the input, I will normalize the input and then bring it into the attention network. I will not normalize it afterwards. Now, you will say how does it matter whether I normalize it before or later? Well, it appears that it matters. Now, theoretically it may it may not make too much sense, but some of these results come through empirical observations. I mean uh, they say it happens and well we have to take it like that, it happens. So, it is one of those things which happened that it so turned out that if you normalize the data in case of transformers before the answers seem to be far better. So, they moved it before, but they also changed the normalization. See, normally, okay. Now, how did they change the normalization? They went to uh, mean square normalization to a different uh, normalization uh, strategy, and I will briefly talk about why that change came. Why the nor first normalization was shifted, it moved from somewhere else to somewhere else, uh, and the algorithm for normalization or the program for normalization that also changed. Okay, that was influenced by a paper which I will show you. At the head of feed forward. Everywhere, oh. everywhere there is normalization. It's the mood it for. Mood it before. So, they introduced the RMS normalization. What is the salient difference? I am not, you can read the paper at length, you at 2 o'clock it will start making sense. Okay. So, it, it does that for me, I do not know. Next, I am just going to talk about a few equations. Okay, equation number 2 just observe the standard thing about normalization is you take mean of all the values correct. Having taken the mean of the values you subtract the mean and then do some scaling. So, the purpose of normalization okay, let us get to the purpose of normalization there are two purposes one is called recentering other is called rescaling. Once again, normalization of data has two fundamental objectives. One is called recentering the data. Recentering the data means what? Every time computing the mean of the data, 
subtracting the mean and dividing by the standard deviation, right? x minus mu by sigma, sigma representing or rho, whatever you use, is called standard, is called taking the mean, okay? Now, this is just the mean, that is, it is called recentering, this is called recentering. So, something is now centered differently because you have subtracted the same value. Now, can you see that gi that is a scaling? So, recentering and scaling, gi is multiplying it with some value so that it remains in a range. So, all normalization in the original attention paper was recentering and rescaling. Now, what they observed is that you should not be doing recentering. If you only do rescaling, you are getting good results. Again, why should this happen? Well, there is a very big theory. They say when we are taking attention, the recentering anyway cancels out. When you are transferring attention, they said there is no effect of recentering. Let it be centered anywhere. If you just ensure that the range of the data is okay, it is fine. So, they said, let us not waste time because see, if you have to do recentering, you have to take a mean, you have to take a standard deviation, you have to do all of that. So, and remember, this is done on every input and all through the layers. And this is done during training time. More importantly, this is done during inference time. So, it slows down. Taking mean, subtracting mean, taking standard deviation, dividing by standard deviation. See, compute power has to be used judiciously. You should not waste compute power unnecessarily. If you waste compute power unnecessarily, without commensurate return, you are an idiot, correct? So, there has to be a judicious combination and you should run it well. So, what they discovered is, let us not use that equation, that is equation 2. Let us use a different equation, RMS norm. So, they said use just this equation. You see the left side equation, uh, the equation number 4. You see there, there is no computation of the mean. Are you seeing that? Mean is mu, mu baba, <laughs> thousands of years. Okay. So, that is called mean computation. There is no standard deviation computation. No, we did not compute standard deviation we did not compute mean and we just did basically ai by rms of a which is just summing and squaring the values and which did not standard deviation of course is just one step away but subtracting the mean and dividing by standard deviation is uh, pretty long and so th we just do the rescaling gi is the scaling so we retain that gi we remove the taking of the mean and taking of the standard deviation, dividing by the standard deviation, life became simple. So, we divided only by the RMS. Okay? So, and when you are dealing with this kind of numbers, it was observed. Obviously, there was some saving in performance, saving in speed. So, to summarize, the change was what? As far as normalization was concerned, change was we moved normalization before the layer First, it is called pre-normalization okay? and second, we change the normalization philosophy from being a recentering, rescaling philosophy to just a rescaling philosophy. We changed it there. This is all Python code at the end of it. What is it all? Bunch of Python code which does this, which people like you have writing. Okay. So, this was the other change. So, let us go back to that network again. Yeah. So now, as, as we move through the network, we see substantial amount of changes happening as the things are moving. Now, for reasons of time, I am going to be a little fast here. Uh, so there was a couple of more changes which happened. Uh, one more change which happened was, uh, I will I'll park it for some other time because that is not so critical. Uh, so let us keep our Right now, the change to only 3 or 4, what we just talked about. Uh, then, this was where Lama scored. This is what Lama did. Then, they realized in the attention architecture 
There came, and this is where I want to spend a little more time, that's why I'm shortening this time. Uh, they went to Lama 2. Now, there is a very significant difference between Lama 1 or Lama and Lama 2. I'll tell you what is the difference. It's something to do with the difference between GPT-3 and GPT-4. See, when a model is released to the public, general public, there is one more care that you need to take. You know what is that? You may be correct, but you ought to be safe also. I, I hope I am reaching this. This is more in the conceptual sense. See, the way your output should be generated, it is for the layman. When the output is generated for a layman, it is not necessary or it is not adequate for the output to be factually correct or it should not hallucinate. It should also be a safe output. It should be an output which is sensitized to common factors. It should not encourage any kind of non-safe activity. Now, there are various ways of defining that. I am not going to go into the definition. Lama did not have any safety wall. It was doing correct answers, but there was no safety wall. And Lama 2, obviously that this area was very important. So they said, no, we can't release this model just like that. Lama 2 at least, we will do safety. Now, for safety, human feedback is necessary because what is safe, a program cannot decide. Human feedback, human training, all of that is required before a model becomes safe to use. Otherwise, it is correct to use, but it is not safe, dangerous. Tomorrow, there may be a lot of problems of, uh, you know, issues with that. So, they used in Lama 2 a, another algorithm which comes not from the standard deep learning computer science, but a branch of AI, which is a very interesting branch of AI called reinforcement learning. Have you heard of this? You have a course, no? Yes. Not now, I think, later. Later. Yeah, you have a course in this, at least in the autonomous syllabus we have. So, there is a course which you will do called reinforcement learning. Now, I will just talk about reinforcement learning briefly. Then I will tell you how Lama 2 uses it to make its model safe. Okay, we will just look at a picture and stop. Now, what is reinforcement learning? Okay, reinforcement learning is typically how robots learn to navigate. Uh, the most common example is they give them example of a multi armed bandit, which is a slot machine. Okay, there are three parts to it. Just understand it at a conceptual level. I am giving in a nutshell. There is something called observation space. There is something called policy. And there is something called action space. And there is something called reward. Let me connect this. I will say it again. There is something called observe, observation space. There is something called policy. There is something called uh, action space. And there is something called reward. Now, how do these relate? Observation space means what I observe or what the machine observes, whatever it observes is called the observation space. Whatever events happen in the observation space uh, outside me, they are called observation space. Now, I am a policy, I am a person, so I am a policy. So, I define if I observe this event, how I should react, that is called my action. Are we there? So, there is observation space, which is the input. Policy is how I think. So, when something happens, policy defines how I think. And then, policy defines what action I take. And some of the actions may get me a reward, or some of the actions may get me a punishment, which is a negative reward. And by setting up a feedback back propagation, I fine tune my policy so that my policy becomes more and more reward oriented. Very simple. Everybody gets it? 
again for my sake action space sorry observation space my policy defines what what i do with it that is my action my action may be a good action may be a correct action or may be a lousy action if that is the case then i have a problem then i get negative reward or a punishment or if i do a good action i get a positive record uh, positive reward so that becomes a feedback to refine my policy so my policy changes earlier when i was your age we still learned reinforcement learning that time but that time our reinforcement learning was not ai based because nobody had heard of what is this today we used to use rule based so in our case when we learned policy this is 40 years back we learned rules for policy now nobody learns rules it's all all this technology back propagation learning all this so anyway but the philosophy is the same okay so basically what they said is now with this background probably i'll show you a picture and from that picture we'll understand what how llama 2 became safe okay so let me just show you that okay i'm going to show you a picture which illustrates how llama 2 learns by the way what they did okay before i go here they first built a reward model now how did they build a reward model this is through human interaction they had to hire human beings so whatever your llm was generated a human being or a bunch of human beings were saying is this safe very safe very unsafe you know various grades so it is through human feedback that they trained a reward model over thousands of sentences okay not all obviously so over thousands of sentences they changed the reward model so the reward model was trained a priori before everything so they created a re nice reward model and now i think you will understand the picture let me take you to the picture itself this is the picture this sentence is interesting so the input sentence is a dog is okay uh so then dog is what you have to complete the sentence now you can say a dog is a furry animal that could be one output a furry mammal a dog is a furry mammal this is one output uh, other output is dog is a man's best friend now i mean given that you have a probability of generating both almost on equal terms what is the output that you will give to the user the user has only entered a dog is you have an option so your regular llm which has not been trained with human feedback uh, that llm will generate as you can see below somewhere uh, a continuation as a furry animal are you with me dog is a furry animal is it factually wrong no it's a furry animal furry mammal Sorry. so factually correct now you are h uh, r l h f based llm which is an llm which has been trained with this repeated feedback from humans using concept of reinforcement learning that will give an output called a dog is the continuation will be man's best friend now you take both of these outputs now you all have a dilemma this this piece didn't exist in llama 2 llama 1 had only the left side piece which is a regular llm it didn't have this right hand side piece the feedback the human uh, feedback reinforcement learning based human feedback that piece didn't exist so that piece is generating a uh, man's uh, best friend so in the given circumstances uh, now a decision has to be made to give what output okay now you will say yeah from a very safe point of view from a more polite point of view rather than saying a dog is a furry mammal i'd be more polite and say dog is a man's friend 
that is a better output to, to generate because it is more polite, more uh, whatever. Uh, you can add all kinds of object. But you know there is a whole lot of maths which is also happening below. Uh, now does it blindly pick what the RLHF has generated? No. Lama 2 is smart. What happens apparently is if you blindly pick on the nicety of the sentence, sometimes these LLMs are hallucinating, they are producing gibberish which has no correlation with the real problem which are only nice. You are getting me? No. There is no point. First, your first premise is what? You should be correct. Then you should be nice. I hope you are getting this. You can't be nice and spew out gibberish. That is not acceptable. You need to be both. But first you should be nice. You should be correct. And then you should be nice. So what they do is, if you see the equation at the bottom, that is, you know, Bayesian probability, right? Y given X, Y conditional to X. X is your input, which is a dog is. So, pi base y x is y is a mammary uh, sorry dog is a furry mammal that is a y that is on the right side. If you see the left side there is another probability distribution working which is called the proximal distribution do not worry about it right now which generates another sentence which is man's best friend. But you notice there there is that parameter there called lambda k l and d k l. Okay. Now, that parameter is the key. That parameter is the one which says, I will, just because it is nice, I will weigh down that nice, I will, I will give it a, I will, I will try to suppress that noise by a KL. Now, KL is uh, another kind of algorithm. Again, I will not go too deep. KL stands for, or KL is a Kiber uh, algorithm. Uh, I forget the names of the two people. Anyway, that is not important. It is called KL algorithm. What it does is, you have heard of probability distributions. Okay. It tells you what is the deviation between two probability distributions. So, it says, I okay, will give you the intuition. It says, this is a, uh, see this, please understand it at least intuitively. This is a correct answer. This is a nice answer. Again, this left side is saying this is a correct answer, right hand side is saying this is a nice answer. Now, I will measure the nice answer and kind of play it down a little bit. How much will I play it down? If the probability distribution it has generated out of that model is at large variance with the correct probability distribution. If the variance is small, then I will go with the nice answer. If the variance in is very big in the probability distribution of my right answer and the nice answer, then I will go with the nice, uh, sorry, go with the right answer. You are with me? I am telling this at a very high level. There is a lot to understand here, a lot of aha moments there, but we will we'll ignore there for the time being. At the essence what it is, is that I will give importance to the, to the nice answer only as long as it does not deviate in its probability distribution too much from the right answer. So, I am not blindly relying on my nice model. I am blending the right model and the nice model such that the nice is not allowed to become nicer at the cost of correctness. You got me? So, this is Lama 2. Now, I have not spelt out all the changes between la as you move to Lama. But the objective of this uh, whole presentation was basically so that you start understanding transformers more deeper and basically to motivate you to think about how will I change transformers to suit purpose. 
Now, given that, you know, there is a lot of scope and lot of work happening in various kinds of experimentation. For example, we just saw the beginning of reinforcement learning used. So many people are using different kinds of reinforcement learning at different portions of this architecture. Maybe someday we will talk about it. Different people are using different ways of optimizing the MHA, the multi-headed attention. There is so much work happening in those spaces. Each of these spaces, believe me, each of that building blocks is rich with opportunity. Somebody can really take it up, so those of you who are interested in deep computer science, can really explore, can really take some of these things forward. First of course, you need to assimilate it, you need to have your, some of your maths story right, but you will have to get comfortable with this because this is come to stay, this is not going away. In fact, your journey into computer science leads through transformer. 